You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than $2.50 per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo Savings Options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another History of the Second World War interview. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Matthew Powell, author of The Development of British Tactical Air Power, 1940-1943, A History of Army Cooperation Command, and currently at the University of Portsmouth Royal Air Force College, Cranwell. Dr. Powell, how's it going? I'm very well, thank you. I've been uh, working on the newest book that I'm trying to get researched, which is going to be on the British aircraft industry in the interwar period. Oh, I will uh, definitely be interested in that <laughs> when it when it is available. I've uh, been reading about that a, a lot recently. Um, so here we're here today to talk a little bit about the the topic of your other book, which is the development of of tactical air power. So I wanted to start off as as a lot of these conversations do uh, on my my podcast right now with the First World War. So. During the First World War, air power really kind of came into its own and began to have a meaningful impact on ground operations. So how did the concept of close air support begin to develop and then evolve during the war? I think if we go even further back before the First World War to 1911 and the first real use of attack as a role of air power by the Italians in Libya, we can see that the opportunity is there to utilize aircraft not only in a reconnaissance role, but also in an attack role. And so we start to see this idea of how would we utilize air power to attack uh, ground forces and aid ground forces in their advancement. Now, the technology used in 1911 is rather unsophisticated. It's somewhat of uh, lean out the side of the aircraft with a small handheld bomb and drop it. So it's not hugely accurate or effective, but the principles are there in terms of how we might develop this. And one of the things that really helps in the First World War on the Western Front in particular is the trench lines that develop and that relatively static nature of warfare from around about the beginning of 1915. And we start to see that trench deadlock and how do you break the stalemate that exists on the Western Front. And one of the keys in that is the use of not only air power, but artillery fire to keep your enemies heads down and keep them sheltering in trenches so you can cross that dangerous no man's land ground and then engage with your enemy. This is where the majority of casualties will be caused for the infantry in the First World War is trying to cross that um, that ground between the trenches where it's open. There's not a lot of cover And so we start to see artillery being used from around about the British 1916 as a way of trying to protect them. We have the the creeping barrage um, of artillery fire being lifted every so often to try and protect ground forces as they advance. So close air support is really just an extension of this from the air um, to try and protect infantry as they advance across no man's land. What we start to see is aircraft start to develop and become more sophisticated, become technologically and technically better um, as the war goes on, is the ability also to conduct ground strafing and to um, strafe uh, forces um, in the trenches and, again, forcing them to keep their heads down. And one of the things that's quickly realised when it comes to close air support in particular is that its physical destruction isn't huge. But the psychological effect that it has 
is almost immeasurable. And that comes through if we advance quickly onto the Battle of France in 1940 and some of the reports from the French 55th Infantry Division around Sedan. The reports that come back from those forces is that they were cowering in half a metre deep slit trenches as the Stukas came from the skies. And they the stories that come out are along the lines of it felt like every bomb being dropped was aimed directly for you and you alone. Now, the physical destruction, not many of the French infantry are actually killed or wounded through these attacks. But the psychological effect is enough for them to, for their morale to be broken exceptionally quickly and to sort of break. And that is part of the reason why the Germans were able to advance so quickly at Sedan in May 1940. So how does it evolve? It becomes more sophisticated. It becomes more coordinated with the artillery and with the infantry. Obviously, as a, an aircraftman, you don't want to be flying around a hazardous sky with artillery shells around you. Um, so there's more um, cooperation. And that's aided by the fact that in up until April, the 1st of April 1918, the Royal Air Force isn't independent. It's the Royal Flying Corps that's attached directly to the army. So its major role is support of ground forces in various different ways close air support being one of them so that cooperation is allowed to develop what's also found is that if the air forces and the ground forces are able to live together or at least socialize together then the level of support improves so there's a real argument for closer collaboration i think in the 21st century in particular when we have the u.s air force the royal air force as independent services, for them to spend greater time with them, socialising, working, getting to understand those they'll be supporting on the ground, because those personal relationships really, really help. And one of the things that was found on something outside of um, close air support with artillery spotting, where aircraft were sent up to watch the fall of shot, was that when new artillery batteries or new squadrons were brought, brought into the line, the level of spotting decreased markedly. So there's perhaps lessons that we could learn from 1914, 1918 in terms of just being able to work together and getting to know people to a greater extent. That seems to improve the capabilities of support that exist. What we also see is a doctrine start to develop. Now, in 1914, there's no real doctrinal principles for air power. The British have thought about control of the air as a doctrinal principle in 1912, but there's no real way of contesting it up until around about 1915 to any real degree. So we start to see the development of doctrine in air power more generally, but particularly in close air support, that there are only certain times that it should be used. So it should be used at points where it's going to make a decisive impact. So if infantry can cross no man's land, without the assistance of close air support it shouldn't be used because it's a particularly dangerous mission for uh, air forces to conduct particularly with aircraft that are vulnerable to small arms fire as the first world war generation aircraft generally are so we start to see this, this sort of principles being developed but what we really see especially in 1919 when trenchard codifies the principles of air power for the independent raf is the idea of control of the air becoming the most important role of air power and everything else is subject to gaining that control of the air. Perhaps something we could link back to the current operations in Ukraine where it appears the Russians haven't gained control of the air and are starting to suffer from this. So that's a, sort of a, a maxim that seems to hold true even in the 21st century. But what we really see, I think, is this idea of how is air power best used to support ground forces? Um, we have two areas of tactical air power that really develop uh, from the First World War. One is close air support. The other is battlefield air interdiction, where aircraft are flying beyond the lines to attack targets such as local command and control headquarters, um, communications, so roads, railways, bridges, ammunition dumps, enemy reserves are, be are being attacked in interdiction operations. And this really sets the scenes for a rather big argument between the Army and the Royal Air Force in the interwar period. You talked a little bit about some of the kind of lessons learned, but how how did the Air Forces around the world kind of evaluate their experiences and other people's experiences from the First World War? And what did they take from those evaluations when they tried to kind of create their 
doctrine looking forward in in the post-war period? So the interwar period is an interesting one because different nations look at air power in different ways. Um, to start with the British, they look at things like the Battle of Amiens in, I think, August, September 1918, and they look at the casualty rates. And on one particular day, it was 30% casualty rates. And they use this throughout the interwar period as a reason to go back to the army and say, we'll only conduct close air support missions in extreme emergencies. Now, this is taking figures and massaging them a little bit. 30% wasn't the usual casualty rate, but it works well for the RAF in that (laughs) respect. The RAF are more focused when it comes to support of ground forces on interdiction operations. They think this is going to have an operational level effect by attacking those targets beyond the front lines. The army naturally enough say what about us when we face our problems when we um, that we haven't planned for that we haven't anticipated but the RAF generally just tend to dismiss these and say we will do this but in emergency only and the RAF because of various factors its independence the inter-service rivalry and the moves by the army and the royal navy to try and have it disbanded as an independent force and go back to the 1914 royal naval air service well, flying course structure feel that they have to promote air power in a way that only they could conduct. And so they focus on three major areas, defense of home airspace, strategic air attack and imperial policing. Now, the evidence for strategic air attack is probably more flimsy than the evidence they put forward not to do close air support when the army sort of starts badgering them to do that. Um, But there's enough there that you can extrapolate that if we could increase the bomb load by X amount, if we could increase the amount of aircraft, then we could have this effect on morale. And so it's very much taking the principle of the naval blockade of the, the British and the French in 1918 on Germany and trying to extrapolate that to hitting civilian targets And Trenchard, in his political role um, as chief of the air staff, has to be a bit more careful than people like Julio Douay, who advocate for just mass terror bombing, chemical weapons, uh, no such thing as a civilian, just attack every town and city you can and raise it to the ground. So Trenchard talks about attacking the morale of the people and that the morale of the Germans is fairly easy to break. The British aren't going to be. It's going to be the usual stiff upper lip, make a cup of tea and carry on. So there's a degree of xenophobia that exists in this as well. Um, But Trenchard comes out with an interesting maxim, and that is that the the physical effect of strategic bombing is, if it's one, then the the ratio is going to be five for the moral effect. Now, one of the really interesting things about that maxim with Trenchard is that this figure differs depending on who he's talking to, depending on what mood he's in. <laughs> At times he says it's 10 to 1, the, phys- the moral to the physical. At times it's 20 to 1, the moral to the physical. And there's no real justification for this. You can't measure morale. You don't know what effect you're having in civilian areas. Um, and the British feel that they can go down this route largely because they're protected by the channel. They don't have a history of a standing army. They haven't been involved in the ground wars of... Uh, Europe for that have gone on for centuries for the most part they get involved obviously in uh, the Napoleonic Wars and the First World War but they like to stay out they like to let Europe let, get on with things themselves um, as long as nobody tips the balance of power so they feel comfortable that they don't need to develop a, a tactical air force the Germans on the other hand and this is partly I think due to the Treaty of Versailles where aircraft are banned you're not allowed to have aircraft And the Germans read into this that if we're not allowed to have aircraft, these must be a really important weapon. So despite being banned, they get together with the other pariah of Europe, the Soviet Union, and start conducting exercises and developing their air power in secret. I think it's more of an open secret. I think most European governments are aware this is happening, but there's too many tensions to really get involved and try and change this. So they start to develop their thinking on air power from the 1920s up until the sort of revelation of the Luftwaffe by Hitler in 1935. But because of their geopolitical position and their position in Europe surrounded by land borders, 
the odds are they're going to face land warfare much more quickly than the British will. And so they require a tactical air force. They require an air force that's going to support their ground forces. They try and design, try and develop a strategic bomber fleet. I think that dies under uh, Weather in around 1936 with his untimely death. And that sort of idea disappears and they move more to twin engine medium bombers rather than four engine heavies. But what's the point of them having this shiny fleet of strategic bombers if they, the French do to them what they do to the French in 1940 and knock them out in six weeks? It's not going to have the time to have the effect at the strategic level. So they take a much different approach to the development of their air power. They're still interested in Douay's ideas, and he's read, I think, more widely than he is in Britain. I think Douay isn't translated in Britain until the mid to late 1930s, so they're developing their ideas on their own. The French are very, very different. The French go through a couple of land doctrinal changes and have an independent air force, then a non-independent air force, and then back to an independent air force in the space of 20 years. So the French start off, they absorb the lessons of the First World War that they move away from the idea of um, attack being the sort of the major proponent of their doctrine, and therefore their air power follows a similar route. The other problem that the French have, particularly in the sort of mid to late 1930s, is that they start to assign squadrons of aircraft to individual divisional commanders, people below division level. And so they're spread out in penny packets, so you can't concentrate your air power. You're not, what are they trying to do? And, of course, these army commanders have very little experience of what they're doing with air power, and so don't know how to use it effectively. Um, the French also go down a very interesting path when it comes to the development of aircraft and the aircraft that they decide, decide to um, build, where they want to have a multi-role aircraft that's capable of reconnaissance, tactical air support, strategic bombing, and um, control of the air. So in essence, it's really a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. And this really gets shown up in 1940 in the Battle of France, where it can't do anything effectively. It can do everything, but it can't do anything to any real degree that's going to have an impact on uh, the air battle that's being fought. It can almost do um, everything and nothing at the same time. Absolutely. It, it, it can do everything, but you can't get it to do the one thing you want it to do at the time you want to do it. They're generally very heavy. They suffer very heavy um, defensive armaments, which slows them down, makes them less manoeuvrable. They can't conduct um, ta- low-level tactical attacks because they just can't fly st- stable at low levels. So they really do struggle. And to, to, to go back to, to the British, which is sort of mark, the area that I concentrated on for the last book, the RAF really pushed this idea of independent air power, defence of home airspace. That's not to say that they don't develop tactical air power principles and they don't look at tactical air power, but it's, a, it's not a priority for them. One of the things that really struck me looking through the documents at the National Archives in London was a series of army cooperation exercises that were held between 1927 and 1933 where they had brigade level exercises, division level exercises with air support providing what they wanted and sort of trying to work out the principles and how this might function. And in each of these reports, one of the first recommendations to come out is the co-location of headquarters, putting army and RAF headquarters within a reasonable distance so you could communicate in person. That's in every single report. So it suggests that this isn't happening and this lesson isn't being learned, despite it being learned from the First World War. In 1940, I think the headquarters of the British Expeditionary Force and British Air Forces in France are about 100 miles apart. So it's not that easy to communicate. It's not that easy to work with your opposite number. And then in the Western Desert in 1941, uh, Montgomery and Air Marshal, Air Vice Marshal uh, Sir Arthur Conningham, the head of the Tactical Air Force in the Western Desert, do a completely revolutionary thing. They put their headquarters together, and lo and behold, tactical air power functions effectively. Um, and to give us sort of an idea to your listeners, 
not only how simplistic this principle is, but how little it is followed. An operation by the U.S. Army, um, supported by the CIA, CIA and the U.S. Air Force in Afghanistan in 2004, called Operation Anaconda, started off as a huge disaster. Because the headquarters of CENTCOM, of the U.S. Air Force, of the U.S. Army, of the CIA, weren't even in the same, weren't even on the same continent, let alone the same country. And so I think we militaries, I think, fall into the trap of thinking that communications technology such as we're using today that allows us to speak across thousands of miles will remove the need to sit down across a table and talk to your opposite number. And I, I don't think that's the case. But it, you can see throughout the history of tactical air power that this idea of co-location of headquarters, it's learned, it's forgotten, it's relearned, it's forgotten, almost continuously you can see it through korea it's relearned it's forgotten it's then got to be relearned in vietnam it's forgotten relearned in the falklands for the british it's forgotten so we see this continual idea and as a historian this frustrates me greatly because it, it's not that <laughs> difficult a concept to implement but i've not yet been able to find an adequate reason why this simple lesson keeps getting forgotten mm-hmm that's a really interesting one where it's like every generation learns it again because they maybe think that a new communication technology, whether, you know, in the interwar period, maybe it's more radios or better radios or something. It's like, oh, this has solved the problem. Yeah, we don't we don't need to do that anymore. It's easier to do it this other way. Yeah, I, I think that's partly down to it is the sort of, I think military forces in general get blinded or overwhelmed by technology and think this will solve all of our problems and we don't have to do any of this. And the army think, well, we don't have to speak to those horrible people in the Air Force anymore. We see them face to face. And that, that's very much what happens in Op Anaconda during the planning phases. It's only in the last five or six days, I think, that the U.S. Air Force is told by the U.S. Army, by the way, you're providing air support for us. And they essentially kick down the Air Force's door and say, you're doing this for us. And so those relationships are really, really difficult in sort of the, the joint environment. And every, every doctrine in every Western military will say, this is really important. We need to do it. We need to do it effectively and we need to get on. And it seems to crumble when you throw that human element into it. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank N.A. Member FDIC. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty, and about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today, and join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode, where I'd like to tell you a story. One of the things you mentioned earlier, and one of the things I've been kind of amazed by when reading about interwar air power topics is around the 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 advocates for strategic bombing were very optimistic in their estimations of what they were capable of doing. And so it's interesting to read like, you know, there's there's an army or or there's some people who want to provide this close air support where the benefits are very tangible and, and maybe 
calculable in, in a reasonable way. And then you have on the strategic bombing side, it's either people like Trenchard making up random numbers about what it's going to do, or it's people taking the most perfect bomb hit in the history of bomb drops and then multiplying that by a thousand and saying, look what we can do. Yeah. And it's, it's been really interesting see, seeing, seeing that as the justification for why they should pursue these strategic bombing initiatives. I, I think that's about right, that it's a very big degree of extrapolation that it takes place after 1918 as to here's the theory, here's the potential of what it can do. And for most of the interwar period, the British aren't capable of doing it. No, I don't think there's any Air Force that's really capable of doing it. But what comes along with it is the fear of the knockout blow from the air. And I think the British, they um, up in the build-up to the Second World War, they order 100,000 cardboard coffins and print millions and millions of death certificates in anticipation of an unprovoked or an anticipated attack from the air and the sheer devastation that it will cause. I think when you start to dig into the thinking of these air forces, particularly the RAF fighting as it is to maintain its independence, and it's not guaranteed to remain independent. Now, I think all services accept the independence of air power and air forces. But in the 1920s, with the cutbacks in military expenditure, the splitting of the defence budget three ways instead of two, the existence of an independent RAF isn't guaranteed. It isn't something that's going to be that you can take for granted. And so this is strategic bombing is more used as a way of saying, if we could have these effects, and that's a very big could, I think in that discussion, then this is why we need to maintain our independence because the army and the Navy simply aren't going to do it. That makes a lot of sense on why they would like latch on to Trenchard's multiplier of the week on, on the effect that it will have. Yeah, and, and Trenchard's an interesting character in this when he's made um, commander of the independent force of the RAF, the, the wing of the RAF that's going to conduct the raids into Germany, the strategic raids. He comes out and says, this is pointless. We should be using all our resources to support the army because that's where the war is going to be won, on the ground, on the Western Front, defeating Germany. Now, when he becomes chief of the air staff for the second time in late 1918, He's done a 180 degree flip on his views and all of a sudden strategic bombing is the real reason why we should have air power and we should not neglect but not prioritise support of ground forces quite as much in that respect. And so again, I think that's the political position that he's in, that if he wants to maintain an independent air force, he has to do certain things. He has to establish a culture for it. It's one of the things that the RF is criticised for. Essentially, when they're created, they steal the ranks of the Navy and the Army. So you have a Commodore in the Navy in the UK. You have an Air Commodore in the RF in the UK. So they lack culture, they lack history, they lack um, heritage. So he has to develop that. And he does that by creating places such as the Royal Air Force College at Cranwell, where I currently teach the officer cadets as they come through. And he does this to basically indoctrinate the cadets into strategic air power so that they can go out and talk about strategic air power as and when they need to. And I've looked at the curriculum that was taught at Cranwell in the 20s and the 30s, and it is very heavily biased towards strategic air power is the best thing that has ever been invented. And you will believe this and you will go out and you will tell everybody about it. <laughs> That's great. So we've mentioned it a few times here, you know, one of the major differences between the RAF and the air forces of some other nations um, was that they were fully independent through this entire period, right after after the First World War. Um, and so how did that kind of affect their ability to sort of make their own way or to plan their own actions and, and sort of choose their own adventure, I guess? It's interesting. There is a relationship that exists between the two, despite the difficulties at the senior command level when it comes to the inter-service rivalry. And the lower down the command chain you go, the more willing people are to work together and to get on. And I think that's sort of exemplary of most organisations. Those at the top are going to have the biggest friction. Those at the bottom just get on with things and just do it. 
What we start to see in the 1930s as the RAF develop their strategic bombing is that they feel they have to give something to the uh, the army. And so they start to develop army cooperation squadrons. They're going to do tactical reconnaissance, artillery cooperation for them. But this is the RAF very much in the lead. There is no army air arm as we have today. The, the fleet air arm in the UK is developed around about the mid-1930s. So even the Navy don't have their own uh, independent air arm um, for them to control. But really what we're seeing here is a big control, a big argument between Army and Royal Air Force over ownership of assets. If you own the aircraft, you can dictate what it is they do. And we, we, we see a difference in vision develop in terms of what air power does, how air power functions and what it can do for ground forces. But we also see a, a big difference in just your terminology and how it's used. And I'll get onto that with an anecdote after looking at sort of the different visions that the Army and the RAF have for air power at the tactical level. And this is one of the things really that comes through and the difficulties in joint operations are those different horizons that exist. So the Army can see the front line, perhaps the horizon no more. That's what they're interested in. If we get in trouble, we want air power on call, give them coordinates, drop your bombs, get out, assist us in that way, the close air support role. Very limited, and that would suit the army greatly. That's this sort of vision, that's the horizon that they can see. Now, with the range and speed of aircraft, even in the 1930s, we're talking 300 miles an hour plus and a range of, say, 250, 300 miles in distance. The RAF look beyond the horizon. What can we target in that interdiction role? How can we assist? It may not have the immediate effect of close air support, but if you can stop reserves, stop ammunition being brought forward, if you can destroy communications and cut off that nervous system of an armed force, you're likely to have a greater effect. And that's the real big battle that happens with the Army and the RAF in Britain, at least up till 1943. And I often tell my cadets when we look at joint operations that in the middle of the biggest war the UK, the West have ever fought, the Army and the RAF were more interested in fighting each other up until 1943. And I think that's it's not good, not good. But I think it's indicative of what happens after the war and the prestige that you get and the influence that you have with politicians. If you can show that you were a decisive factor in the outcome. And so this happens in, in Britain, in the Western desert. It's somewhat different because there are active operations going on. But the lack of active operations in Britain or for Britain or to conduct from Britain into the onto the continent means there's nothing else for these services to do. So they argue with each other. And they, like I said, this goes on until 1943. The other real key issue I think that exists is in terminology. And when we teach the cadets, we teach them the, the idea of control of the air and what it means, the ability to utilise um, the air for your own uses and to deny the same to the enemy. Now, in the Battle of France... And after it, the, British, the War Office conduct a report into the Battle of France, which is heavily biased against the RAF. And it's a wonderful report just for that reason only. But in it, you start to see how the army define the idea of control of the air. And it's not that dynamic gaining control of it to utilise it and denying it to your enemy. For the British army, control of the air is, in fact, a defensive umbrella of fighters above ground forces protecting them. And that can lead, I think, to all sorts of problems. And it's something I warn my cadets about to make sure you understand and you define the words that you're using, because you could walk in in 1940 in France to a meeting with the army and say, first things first, we need to gain control of the air. And they would say, absolutely agree with you 100 percent. And you would both walk out of there not understanding what the other had meant. And so that's really, really interesting. And the, and the report that's issued um, so it's heavily critical of the RF and puts them under a huge amount of pressure to create Army Cooperation Command by essentially saying the British Army was actually OK, it did OK, really didn't. But they try and move the blame away from themselves and to say, well, it was all the RAF's fault. If we'd had better air support, we'd have been OK. And there's, there's a line in the report that says if we'd met the Germans on our own terms, we would have been successful. 
And I was amazed that a line like that could have got through because if you can't meet the enemy on your own terms and be successful, there's something fundamentally flawed with what you're doing. But that got through fine. And it's, read the, it's, um, it's called the Bartholomew Committee Report. And I, I investigate it quite a lot in the book. It is a really interesting report um, to read just from the, sort of the attitude of the army. Um, but it does lead to the creation of, of Army Cooperation Command uh, in 1st of December 1940, a sort of the specialist command alongside fighter command and bomber command for uh, the development of tactical air power in sort of Britain in, in sort of 1940 to 43 when it's disbanded in mid 43. Yeah, that, that's a really good example. The, the the terminology piece there is a really good example of how even small misunderstandings of what's going to happen can cause massive problems. And, and that's maybe sometimes just what you get when you don't have close cooperation over a lengthy period of time and you're trying to implement that close cooperation on a short time schedule without a lot of experience. Yeah, and that's something that certainly happens in 1938-39 where war is becoming much more likely and things are becoming much more serious. So the army and the RAF sit down and actually work out how they're going to do this. And it's really interesting that in that report, uh, the Bartholomew report, the army get the RAF get criticised because they don't conduct close air support, despite the fact that the War Office have agreed in 1939 before they embarked to France that the RAF aren't going to c- provide a lot of close air support and will provide a lot of interdiction. So even when things are agreed, when it comes to that sort of higher level political influence, bl- blame shifting, trying to get your way out of difficult positions, even things that you've agreed don't often go down very well yeah that's interesting you you didn't do the thing you said you weren't going to do now this is your fault yeah absolutely (laughs) you should have done that yeah so so coming into the second world war you know looking at the various sort of air forces uh that, that get involved you know are there some interesting sort of statements or comparisons that we can make between how they viewed close air support or how they implemented close air support uh within their uh national doctrine Yeah, I think a comparison of the RAF and Germany are are an interesting one here. Now, the Germans are much more adept at close air support. They've worked out the communications problems that exist in terms of on-call close air support, which has not been pre-planned. But there's a myth that emerges about the Luftwaffe from the Battle of France that it's a close air support force only. Um, That's really not the case. And the, the Luftwaffe are much more adept at gaining localized control of the air over the sort of Schwerpunkt, the German word for the decisive point of operations, through interdiction operations. So before the Germans advanced to the Meuse River uh, from the 10th of May 1940, the Luftwaffe were actually conducting operations to knock out French and British airfields, aircraft on the ground to gain that localized uh, control of the air to allow them to utilize the close air support they use at Sedan. Now, the other two crossings in 1940 um, at Namur and Dinant are done without any close air support whatsoever. Artillery support is all that's needed. So it's somewhat of a myth that emerges from there. So the Germans very much are adept at this, at the tactical and the operational levels. The British start to learn and start to develop from the summer of 1940 after the evacuation at Dunkirk and actually start to develop a better communication system than the the Luftwaffe have. The Luftwaffe only have a one-way communication system where the ground can talk to the air, the air can't talk back to the ground. Now, due to a misunderstanding of German capabilities in the Bartholomew report, the pressure is on the RAF to create a communication system that's two-way in nature, where the ground can talk to the air and vice versa. And so an exercise um, on communications is held in Northern Ireland in uh, September of 1940 between an army and air force officer in which they'd work out the communications and they set up what are called at at that point close support bomber controls. And this is a joint headquarters of army and air force personnel that can handle the calls of six or seven different formations on the ground sift through them, decide which are the most important, and then report back to each of the formations with either, yes, your air support is approved and is on the way, or no, you have to go and find a way to do it. So that that communications is really uh, important. The RAF, I think, are still not keen on conducting close air support 
But I think politically, they need to do it. Now, they try and avoid doing it as much as possible. They do it to a fair degree in the Western Desert. And once we move into 1944 and um, the post-D-Day operations that are conducted in France, they're very adept at doing it. They've gained the experience. They've got the knowledge. They have to adapt their doctrine and their sort of communications principles to suit each theatre. But the building blocks are there. The basic principles exist for them to... Um, develop and to move on to what they need to do and how they need to adjust what they're doing because operations aren't quite as um you can't transfer them from the western desert to the bocage of normandy for example so a little bit like that the americans when they enter the war essentially pick up british doctrine they experiment with it they adjust it to suit themselves and the forces that they have but they very much use British doctrine as a starting point when it comes to it. And I think because they're tied into the army, even though they do have semi-independent forces in terms of things like the 8th Army Air Force um, that's doing the strategic bombing over Germany, they very much see how important close air support is to um, British to their ground forces and to assisting them. And so I think they're, they're much more willing to embrace close air support, whereas... Even up until 1945, I think it's something the RAF do through gritted teeth and accept that they have to do it. But they'd much rather be doing the interdiction operations or especially in the case of Bomber Command, they don't want their aircraft being taken off them and used for interdiction and close air support operations in preparation for Normandy. And the AOC and C um, of Bomber Command, Sir Arthur Harris, very much resents having his aircraft taken from him in the build up to D-Day. Um, to be used for operational and tactical level operations. It's interesting to learn how how nations like learn and grow. Like I think one of the most interesting parts of, of the Second World War or the First World War, uh, for that matter, is just seeing how how they evaluate success and failure, and how those evaluations influence what they change moving forward. Yeah, I think that's something that is ongoing in militaries uh, to this day. I think one of the biggest problems militaries have got when it comes to that sort of learning process is that they can identify the lessons that need to be learned. They're very bad at translating them into actual lessons learned and making the changes that are needed. And I think that goes back to what I was saying in terms of co-location of headquarters. They identify that really, really important. But I've, I've given talks on tactical air power development that said, OK, we're going to take this one example, co-location of headquarters, and we jump through all the different wars that have been fought in the 20th century. And each time it comes up as an issue where it wasn't put in place. Thank you so much for, for joining me here today um, and for chatting with me about this. My, my pleasure. Always happy to do these sorts of things. It's always good fun.